AJA Zoom event. My name is Courtney Schneider, and I'm the new AJA Director for Children and Families. Also on the screen is Dr. David Adler, President of the AJA. As usual, if you'd like to ask a question, then the best way is to raise your hand uh, with the reaction button. Written questions can also be placed in the chat function, and if we have a chance, we may get to some. Tonight, our event is entitled Protecting Children from Radical Gender and Political Activism. We have the pleasure of hosting a colleague of mine, Catherine Kat Karina, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Active Watchful Waiting, a nonprofit organization that educates and lobbies against the medicalization of minors. Through the subcommittee called In Defense of Children, Kat actively works to counter gender ideology and Marxist indoctrination in educational settings. She has a rich background in educational tech startups and working with vulnerable youth and young adults, as well as expertise in new technologies for universities, schools, and corporations. She has worked in content creation, research, community building, business development, testing, and rapid learning. Before I hand it over to Kat, I just want to take a couple minutes to speak about how I became so passionate about this topic. I encountered two different instances where gender ideology directly targeted my three children. The first was in an Australian secular crash where they were celebrating an international LGBTQ awareness day, putting on rainbow activities for the babies and toddlers. Needless to say, I, I my personal preference was to take my child out and re-enroll him in a Chabad crash. The second was at my children's Jewish day school, where a selection of sexualized books were promoted on the school's library Instagram site. I digitally purchased the, a selection of these promoted books and documented the ex sexually explicit material I found, which includes, but is not limited to, graphic sexual scenes, graphic and erotic descriptions of genitalia, incest, child rape, and various other deviations of sex, and of course, transgender ideology, and what I consider to be very obvious Marxist ideology. After approaching the school to challenge the existence and promotion of these materials to minors and children, and to point out a number of globally accredited studies proving the harmful effects of sexually explicit material on minors, the school dug in their heels behind the excuse of inclusivity, and a few months following, our financial assistance at the school was canceled mid-year without ex explanation. I would just like to say that this phenomenon of uh, objectionable curricula is not unique to just one Jewish school, and it is not unique to non-Orthodox Jewish schools, and I've seen this firsthand. What we have on our hands is a massive breakdown in child safeguarding, education, Jewish values, Australian values, and of course, standards of decency. Before you ask, how the heck did we get to this point? Let me hand it over to our expert. Take it away, Kat. Yes, mate. Let me just share. Sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that first thing. Just have it. Just give me a thumbs up if you can see that. It's just started, yes, all good. Oh, good, 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 good. So In Defense of Children aims to raise awareness of gender ideology and Marxist indoctrination in K-12, K-1 to K-12 schools. And a key focus of our work is to gather evidence for potential class actions against departments of education across Australia, citing breaches of duty of care. And my talk will provide an overview of the core issues we're observing in Australia. So this will, I've got to apologize because this will be a fire hose type presentation because there's so much to cover that we can't. So the aim is to give you a broad landscape of the gender, sex and political ideologies and activism that's nearly one third of the school curricula <clears throat> to identify the key trends and to serve as a call to action. To start, I want to share some of the reports we're getting from parents and this is just in a four week period. And then I'll share a few slides and see if you're aware of what is part of schooling today. So just in a snapshot, on We're at Purple Day this year, 50 five, zero, children were suspended in one week for removing LGBTQIA posters and flags from John Ibbinson's High School in Western Sydney. A Cogra High School, a parent reported a teacher reporting a 13-year-old girl to the hate unit of the New South Wales police after she expressed her anger towards the notion of identifying as a cat or dog to the teacher who was teaching it. In ACT school, a child has been suspended two times for misgendering and a third time for complaining about the noise of a squeaky toy 
used by a boy who identified as a dog. At Shenton College in Western Australia, a relief teacher was informed, and other teachers confirmed it, that one in four students at the school identified as trans. And in a Victoria College, Catholic college, a parent reported her 14-year-old son purchased sex with a girl for $5 in the gender-neutral unisex toilet. And then in a school in Victoria, a number of six-year-olds burst into tears after being shown photographs of naked genitalia as part of the school's new grade one to two sex education program. Okay, so I can't see it, but what I want you to do is um, put your thumbs up or thumbs down. If you're aware of a these few slides, I'm gonna share this information about how school is organized. So number one, were you aware? Researchers from the Institute of Public Affairs, IPA, conducted a comprehensive analysis of the content in every education faculty of 37 Australian universities. Of the 37 Australian universities that offered teachers' qualifications in 2023, culminating in a report titled, Who Teaches the Teacher?, which was just released about a week or so ago. And according to their findings, nearly one third of all teaching subjects in universities relate to woke concepts and ideology, while less than one semester or 10 weeks is dedicated to the teaching of core literacy and numeracy skills. So that's 3,713 subjects currently offered to teaching students. 1,169 subjects teach issues related to critical social justice or critical race theory and social justice, while fewer than one in 10 teaching subjects about literacy and numeracy. So Dr. Bella de Brera, de Brera um, she's a director of the IPA, said, instead of being taught how to master core academic curriculum, such as reading and writing, mathematics, history and science, prospective teachers are being trained by the university lecturers to be experts in critical social justice, identity politics and sustainability. Number two, were you aware? Schools can keep secrets from parents, even really important um, secrets. Schools make the assumption that to gender a transition of kids with body dysphoria or what's called gender dysphoria, who've got extreme discomfort about the body they're in, if they, if they think it's in the child's um, best interest, they can keep that knowledge from the parent. And they leverage privacy laws that have no minimum age to keep secrets from parents if they feel the parents would not approve. So they can go ahead and gender transition. I'll go into that a bit more if you don't know anything about that. They misrepresent the Care and Protection and Anti-Discrimination Acts to act on what they think is the best interest of the child, and in doing so, engage the child in the first part of a three-step powerful psychotherapeutic process called gender-affirming care, the first of which is a social, social transitioning or gender transitioning. Number three, in Australia, we follow UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisations, Comprehensive Sex Education Program. This program is fairly mandatory in the Western world. If you're a poor country and if you want UN funding or support, it's mandatory that you have this in your country. Some of the ideas, just a few of the ideas underneath the Comprehensive Sex Education Program are these. The right to sexual pleasure, even at a young age, takes precedence over all other rights. Children have privacy and confidential right, confidentiality rights that supersede their parents' rights to guide their sexual education, no matter what age. They push for internationally recognized rights to health and education, and that includes that children have a right to all sexual information free from censorship and without parental consent. So who decided that the world's children would, should have all these sexual rights and should be taught about and encouraged to experiment with high-risk sexual acts? The Kinsey Institute has advisory capacity with the UN. It's called UNI, uh, UNIS, uh, UNISOC, ECOSOC ECO status. And it was founded by a man called Dr. Alfred Kinsey. Dr. Alfred Kinsey conducted research, oh, quotation marks, 
on the sexuality of children that was based on data obtained from pedophiles who sexually abused infants, toddlers, and older children in his book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. And Kinsey included Table 34, which documented cases of child sexual abuse that involved inducing orgasms timed with a stopwatch over a 24-hour period. Now, I want you to look at this table so you know what you're seeing. Over here, you've got a four-year-old child with a pedophile for 24 hours, and they say that that child had 26 orgasms. And what was that? While Kearnsey claimed that he did not instruct the abusers to commit these acts, he included the data they provided to him in his scientific research. And Kinsey argued that his uh, research showed that children derive sexual pleasure from the abuse when they displayed distressing symptoms like crying, convulsing, screaming, or bleeding. GSA, or Gender Sexual Alliance Clubs, are being established in high schools across Australia. Some of them um, are called standout clubs. They are where young people are trained in how to do meetings, activism, recruitment, and their goal is policing queer-friendly culture, LGBTQIA culture. One of their roles is to report students and teachers who misgender students and identify potential transgender students for gender-affirming care. Okay, so students who are reported they might be suspended and teachers have their employment at risk if they're reported. If state governments bring in heavy sanctions and vilification laws, and if you've been up on the play, that's what they've been discussing on LGBTQIA, kids will be policed in school more thoroughly with heavier penalty, and adults and organisations who have signed up to ACON's Pride and Diversity Audits, which is pretty much everywhere, for example, the Premier's Department, the Office of Women, all your major government, um, both state, federal and local, and most of your uh, most of your, um, particularly your larger organisations. They're signed up to ACON's Pride and Diversity Audits. They'll be monitored by a mandatory LGBTQIA adult club that also reports to regulatory bodies those who are not compliant. Number eight, or number six, were you aware the gender industry kicked off when a number of pharma, like Stryker Medical Corporation, and then they got together their lawyers and marketing providers and redefined the problem of gender dysphoria. A problem for the last, before 10 years ago, it was a problem particularly common with gay youth, autistic or abused kids. And the common uh, approach was um, to, to, to approach this as a mental health condition, which requires psychotherapy. So gender dysphoria, if you don't know, or body dysphoria is a condition in which youth feels confused are uncomfortable with their biological sex, causing them extreme psychological distress. And it's really common with LGB kids. Most um, LG adults, if you ask them when they were a kid, they always felt they were in the wrong body because they had opposite sex attraction. So they're always asking, well, what's wrong with me? So in the past, the problem was resolved with psychotherapy and going through puberty because puberty is a great cure-all, which makes pharma no money at all, though. <laughs> but affirming a child as being in the wrong body agreeing with that idea of a young LGB kid particularly, allows that body to be fixed. And the fix for pharma is drugs, hormones, and surgery to the appearance of the opposite sex, which will need to be maintained for the rest of their life. Were you aware? Okay. And understand that this is a huge industry, which a lot of organizations are making money from, and all of it is underpinned by this one concept of gender identity, the idea of gender identity, okay? Product sales come from gender drugs, HIV, STD drugs, hormones, and surgeries. Funding for shilling these products by trans lobbies. Funding a pipeline in kids to porn and sex trafficking for the child sex industry. I'm not kidding. Pharma-backed trans research industries influence a revenue stream through social media, medias, TikTok, YouTube, etc., and power for bureaucracies and ancillary industries. It's mainly through bureaucracies like your HR that, get, uh, that are pushing and driving this in the government and corporate organisations. And all this is possible is made by this concept of gender identity. Now, I'm assuming 
you might a lot, a lot of people don't really know what we're talking about when we're talking about gender identity ideology. What you're looking at on the screen is uh, the definition that was provided by um, a group of LGBTQI activists who met at Yoga Kata and they formed a bunch of principles. And one of those principles was defining this gender identity, which if you read, um, makes no rational sense whatsoever. And in a sense, inherently, it's like a soul. It's something that you feel. Okay, So the, this key definition for gender identity is used in law. It's, in, it's used as a basis of conversion therapy bill in Victoria, the births and deaths and um, certificates and marriages and statistics in Queensland. It's inherently broad. Um, and by the way, the ARC International um, that propagates it all around the world was founded and funded by Stryker Medical Corporation, uh, one of the largest gender industry organizations. Okay. All right, that screen is not appearing for some reason, which is a bit of a worry. Never mind. There's what number one, there is no, oh, it is on that screen. Okay, fair enough. Okay, good. There's no empirical evidence for gender identity akin to a soul. A group of about 100 clinicians, researchers from around the world have stated there is no scientific evidence to support this, the existence of gender identity, nor is there any laboratory test that can accurately differentiate between a person who identifies as trans and one who does not. That's a really important thing to know. This is an idea, ideology. It's not evidence-based. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, you can. Good. We know it's a, a disproven original theory that, that underpins this whole industry and this whole ideology. The concept of gender identity was popularized by John Money in the 1960s and famously proven wrong when he attempted to raise a boy as a girl. This boy had been accidentally castrated from a botched circumcision, and Money believed that being male or female was socially constructed. And after being raised as a girl for the first 30 months of life, that boy would identify as a girl. That boy was David Raymer. That didn't work. And the boy who, who later became, um, took back his, his real name, David, eventually reclaimed his birth sex. But sadly, he and his um, twin brother um, suicided as adults. Schools teach everyone has an internal sense of gender identity. But there's no agreement on whether there are two genders, 112, or as many are there people in the world. Gender dysphoria has always been a diagnosable mental condition for up to 20 or so years ago, but pharmacological cure is dependent on it being framed as a gender identity in the wrong body. And that's what they say, you were born in the wrong body, which requires fixing. And a fix that creates a lifetime annual recurring revenue stream through drug hormone dependence. This is particularly true of children who are their main target. Affirming the idea of a transgender or gender identity is for most, for most impressionable youth creating actually a transgender identity because without a community of school staff, counselors and children affirming that the child has in fact a gender identity or a, an opposite identity or a transgender identity, that incongruence or disconnect with their body will for most, 80 to 98% of them, will, it will dissipate once through puberty. They'll be cured once through puberty. And a thing to note, with most kids who have a strong body dysphoria, imagine a, a child who's been raped and not friends with their body at all. Over 43 to 73% of these kids have gender dysphoria, often have autism, that's really high, it's about 50%. Sexual assault, other types of trauma, internalized homophobia, over 70% of these kids are um, potential LGB, and other undiagnosed conditions that require professional evaluation and family support. However, one of your roles of your GSA club, your counselors and teachers, is a tendency to interpret all these types of conditions and vulnerabilities, and even... We've heard it on um, secret recordings that they target specifically vulnerable kids, that the, all these conditions are proof that that child has a gender identity issue. So in Australia, a key figure in introducing um, 
It's another thing that you need to be aware of. In introducing Marxism and queer indoctrination, et cetera, in schools is a woman called Ros Ward. She is a Marxist who admitted in a number of Marxist conferences, 2013, 2014, 2015, et cetera, that the program that she and three other authors produced called the Safe Schools Coalition Australia program was a vehicle to retrain Australian youth to be Marxist or socialist and queer. She sold it as an anti-bullying program for LGBTQIA. Okay. So I need to unpack Marxism fairly crudely. If anyone's very well versed in Marxism, you're not going to like what I say. Talk to me about it later. But very clear for our purpose, many are familiar with the classical Marxist theory, which centers on the idea that the main cause of societal inequality is due to economic factors as the axis of oppression. This theory asserts that capitalism is responsible for the majority's struggles, proletariat, suggesting the elimination of private property as a solution. However, by the 1960s, given the mass killing in you know, Russia and China, et cetera, the appeal of this perspective waned in the West. Marxists shift, began to shift their focus from solely economic to the broader sphere of culture. So this evolution led to the development of critical theory over in Frankfurt and American universities, et cetera, and essentially transitioning from an economic-based Marxism to what's now termed cultural Marxism by people like James Lindsay. Cultural Marxism argues for, argues for a significant societal overhaul. It believes that our Western culture at its very core has deeply embedded oppressive systems. And the only way they argue to ensure true equality is to dismantle and reconstruct society on entirely new principles. So currently there's several branches of cultural Marxism theory for our purposes are being discussed and taught in schools. This is the third one, this one, third wave feminism. Not too long ago, by the way, just pointing out this one here, Parkdale Secondary College, the boys had to stand up and apologize for him being male. And this kind of thinking, by the way, is coming from, uh, from daycare and up. Critical race theory. Here, the focal point, point is race or axis of oppression. Um, it argues that societal structures perpetuate systematic racism, disadvantaging certain racial and ethnic groups systematically. They, they dumb things down considerably to really singular oppos opposites like black is good, white is evil, you know. Um, so, for example, over the last two weeks, you've noticed that you've got a group called Teachers for Palestine, both in uh, Victoria and Sydney. They're doing things like inviting uh, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas activists to talk and train kids in school. Um, Palestine, because generally speaking, Palestine, they look darker. <laughs> They're painted as indigenous. That's another thing that they jump on, BLM, Black Lives Matter, etc. So therefore, they're, they're oppressed because they're dark. Israel seems to be whiter, and Israel's very powerful. It's got a lot of resources, and it's really, it really has an amazing success in the area. Um, so it's seen as all-powerful aggressive because of its power. So Palestinians as helpless victims are without agency, and they're oppressed, are, of course, inherently virtuous, and the oppressors are deserving of any negative consequence whatsoever anything. So that's why you're seeing people denying October the 7th, or in a sense saying that they deserved it. So Teachers for Palestine, Sydney, and Melbourne advocate for decolonization and are knowingly crying from the river to the sea. And you'll notice that that activism is quite strong and kids are defying the Ministry of Education, Department of Education, with, um, led by the teachers. So queer theory sees heteronormativity as the main axis of oppression. To be heterosexual <laughs> is inherently privileged and oppressive. So query theory is about queering the binary, making it queer, destroying norms, destroying normality. All forms of sexuality, they believe, particularly coming from Alfred Kinsey, should be normalized. And that's not as you would think. 
is homosexuality because generally people accept that people can be homosexual these days okay no it includes also pedophilia uh, pushing children's right to sex without parental censorship from zero age it's introducing bestiality and we see the soft version of it with these um what's called furries dressing up as different animals etc or being taught that you can identify as a cat or a dog i kid you not We've had reports of several schools in South Australia, New South Wales and ACT teaching kids to identify as dogs and cats and introducing theories in Drag Queen Story Hour. Everything you see on the screen, by the way, is all from Australia, except for this one here, which is a worst case scenario. I've only heard that's happening in um, Australia, but I haven't seen it yet. But it gives you an idea. So we say... We have a big issue with schools because a large portion of it is more about indoctrination than actually education. And if you really pause and stop and think of that through, that bodes incredibly poorly for the whole of Australia. Am I overstating it? I don't think so. Defying the Ministry of Education Act, as teachers, as I said, took kids out of class to march on pro Hamas and climate change rallies. I had a look at the letters that the Ministry of Education wrote I looked at the replies. It's, it's, um, it's ridiculous when the teachers aren't even adults. So we end in defense of children, and we hope you um, join us in all your different capacities. We want to reclaim education. And we're taking, we've identified two major approaches that we're taking. One is to focus on the school's legal breaches of duty of care, of which we've identified two key areas, social transitioning, because in a sense it's putting kids on a conveyor belt to physical irreversible harm via drugs, hormones and surgery, and I'll explain that shortly. And the second one is identifying controversial issues, identifying violations of non-contact sexual abuse, which is a breaking the law, sanctions on kids for non-compliance to Marxist and queer ideologies. We're regularly getting um, parents reporting that kids are suspended because they're not compliant. Um, restricting kids' access to education by not compliant and think like misgendering, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and then we're also exploring the school system used to pipeline kids as consumers to drug clinics and also, of course, to gender clinics. And um, looking at prohibiting content that furthers the financial interests of trans lobbies who we find are also sex clinics and also the educators of the socialist and political and queer, um, particularly hypersexualized um, agenda. So that's one area that we're major um, attacking. Um, and the second one is we think it's important that we need to have parental training, that we need parents um, have a, a really clear understanding of what's going on in school and why. And one of the things we're doing is a program that I got from a lovely company over in America called Courage is a Habit, which he, they allowed us to um, convert for Australia, which is uh, woke inoculation training for parents. It's um, parents training to inoculate your child against woke and bolster family bonds. And particularly um, uh, another program, God's Parent Dinner Hour, and we're insisting that we ha have kids at dinner, off the table, on the table, away from the screens, and start, uh, start building your bonds with children because um, this is not just to protect kids, but to stop radical societal change by stealth. Um, gender identity and pins of gender uh, industry and radical societal change is via this cultural Marxism that's been introduced by stealth in the schools. So just so if you don't know, what is duty of care? This is a legal responsibility. Schools have a legal obligation to include a duty of care to students arising from a principle of negligence. This is law. Courts have established that this is an automatic, non-delegable responsibility, and the school can be held liable for breaches of this duty. Schools are not allowed to harm your child, whether by intent or negligence. So how do schools breach duty of care? Mm. Schools are instructed by trans advocates 
that to prevent potential child suicide of kids that they've identified as having a gender identity or being in the wrong body, in other words, they're called trans or transgender, um, it's crucial to affirm that gender identity, gender identity is the opposite sex because that, they say, is in the child's best interest. That's a phrase that's very important, a child's best interest. Um, so the trans call this process gender-affirming care. Um, and gender-affirming care is made up of socially, medically, and surgically transitioning a child. Surgically doesn't happen to all, but it's part of the plan. They often cite false statistics to back that stance, usually funded by pharmaceutical organizations, funny that, saying if you do not affirm them, your the child will commit suicide, a scary thing for all parents and teachers and parents uh, and principals. However, every systematic review of the evidence so far in um, countries like UK, Denmark, France, Norway, Finland, et cetera, and many states in the USA have shown when you do a systematic review, this is the highest level of review, it's proved that gender-affirming care has low to very low quality evidence to support it as a therapeutic practice. So what, what anyone who's an, um, a parent who's had their child taken by the state or parents here or teachers here, et cetera, okay, is that a, a something we call the suicide narrative. In fact, emerging evidence is despite the suicide narrative that the suicide is a risk after medical surgical transitioning. So the suicide narrative is, would you rather have a live son than a dead daughter? Would you rather have a live daughter than a dead son? Okay. Um, but the true harm to these students' lives in the medical transitioning itself, which social transitioning is a pathway for. In words of a psychologist, never before in mental health has an exaggerated possible death rate being used to promote interventions for children that are so poorly evidence-based and have such a high risk of harm. So let's have a look at that, what social transitioning is. I know this is a lot of stuff to take in, that's why it's a bit, a bit high, but we go through this in the training. So the first part of gender-affirming care is social transitioning, which starts with a change of um, documentation, school documentation, and that means that the recording of a student's um, gender identity, so if it's a girl, they might record it as a boy or a trans or a, a trans trans boy, um, and referencing the, the child's um, new, new name, giving them um, the opposite prona sex pronouns, change of uniform, and, and, um, uh, and giving them permission to go into the, different, into the opposite bathroom. Understand this is not a neutral act. Most youth, if pushed to social transition, will move on to the second stage, which is medical transitioning. And it's like 98% at the very bare minimum. Everyone's saying 100%. I find it hard to believe 100%, but 98%. And you've got to understand that this is a, a snapshot of um, Safe Schools' gender affirmation uh, plan in, in um, graphic form. You'll notice here and establish a support team. Imagine you've got a young kid, kid of six years old, seven years old, surrounded by parent, teachers, principal, and counselors, all telling them that they're the opposite sex. It's not a neutral act. Most youth will move on to the second stage of medical transitioning. This involves taking chemical castration and endometriosis drugs that are used to interfere or block puberty. And commonly, they're called puberty blockers, and they're used off-label, these drugs. Cross-sex hormones comes next, and the last stage is extreme body modification. So um, breast amputation, uh, mastectomies, uh, physical castration, um, or inversion of um, the penis, or other things we'll see shortly. Instead of a future healthy life with body undamaged, these children who medically transition are set on the course for lifetime pharmacological dependence an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, thrombosis, sterility, and probable sexual dysfunction. I won't go too much into this because you can read it up on our website, but if you go to our site, you'll understand that trans activists say puberty blockers pause puberty. It's even on ACON's transhub.org.au website. This is a lie. It's absolutely false. 
Transharp is a project of ACON. It promotes the use of these drugs to pause, so-called pause puberty. And they're in the, and it's supposedly they recommend that um, they use three or four times a year for kids nine years and up. Again, if you actually physically look at the directions that come with these drugs, the manufacturer puts a limit of no more than five months for patients in late stages of cancer and endometriosis. They're harmful, but most of the people in late stages of cancer, cancer and endometriosis are going to die. So, you know, it doesn't quite matter. Puberty blockers are harmful. Early animal trials pointed to the harm we've seen occur, in fact, in early adopted gender clinics in Sweden and Finland who jumped on these puberty blockers force first. I mean, there's a kid who is young as 11 who so severe, has such severe damages to his spine, he cannot leave his bed. He's got joint problems, and there's also um, evidence of impaired mental cap capability. And understand once kids, again, I'm repeating this, are on puny blockers, it's nearly 100% they'll go on to cross-sex hormones. Cross-sex hormones cause irreversible negative effects, depending how to look at it. Um, increased risk of cancer, breast, cervical, ovarian, and uterine, um, stroke, cardiovascular issues, type 2 um, diabetes, blood clots, sexual dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go too much into it. Okay. Surgery is the final step in the gender affirmation process and a step that younger and younger teens are un undergoing. Minors are increasingly approved for gender reassignment surgeries. Overseas girls as young as 13 are now being referred to double mastectomies. And teen boys are having their genitals permanently altered or inverted or removed by gender reassignment surgeries. In Australia, the youngest we've known is 14. And with the legal recognition of a third sex, this is non-binary, um, that's actually created a new industry called nullification surgery. Okay, so I'm going to give you a warning. The next slide, if you um, are disturbed by a graphic image, and this is a graphic image, you might want to close your eyes until I tell you to open them. Okay. Um, so I apologize, but I really think you need to understand what this looks at. And so we've taken some that are not quite as bad as you'd normally see. Okay. So I'm, so, it's a, I'm sorry this is graphic, but you need to know this is what's happening with kids is castration. Breast amputation, in my opinion, is just essentially mutilation of healthy bodies. I mean, the Catherine Deves last year when she said this was mutilation on TV, everyone screamed at her like she was a nutto. Down the left-hand side where you see nullification surgery, that's where they take off everything, any kind of genitalia, any kind of breast, anything that suggests that that's a male or a female, and they just leave room for going to urination. That's it. Everything looks like a Barbie doll. To make phallics, um, false penises, the flesh is taken off the arms or the legs and wrapped around, and these things can just fall off, necrotize, you know. Um, my friend Kath's father is a surgeon. He is called out of retirement uh, to do repairs on these type of surgeries, about 70% of these surgeries. I'm not sure if that's changed or it's got better, but at the time, 70% um, of these surgeries have complications requiring further surgeries. Okay, I am going to go to the next screen. If you've closed your eyes, you can open them. So although teachers and schools aren't sometimes directly involved in medical transitions, they're not doctors, they shouldn't be doing this at all, they're not psychologists or anything, but they contribute because they put them on the pathway. It is literally kind of like a conveyor belt. They um, Social transitioning at school almost always, I'm going to repeat this over and again, almost always leads to medical transitioning. And that is where really the major physical harms start. There's other kinds of psychological harms of social transitioning alone, particularly concerning confusion about reality. Um, and then, of course, potentially leading students towards harmful surgical procedures. These kind of books, this is this is all from Australia, by the way. This book I took a photo of, my um, godchild, he's three years old. He got this book, and right in the corner here, this little girl is saying, I'm trans. And, of course, this is happy pictures of... Um, Taking, cutting off your breasts and taking drugs to become a trans uh, male. So here's how breach of duty of care works legally. If schools don't allow social transitioning, our argument is 
it's very, very plausible that fewer students would proceed to medical transition, that thus reducing the potential harm. So we have to establish a breach involving four steps, one step, that the teacher-student relationship inherently establishes a duty of care. Is that true or false? Yes, it's true. Tick. The second step revolves around the question of whether schools are acting with less care than a reasonable person would. Should they not be aware that instructing students in gender ideology, which, by the way, is not mandated anywhere that they should do so. Anyway, if they should instruct students in gender ideology and facilitate social transitioning, which puts them on a medicalization path, isn't this establishing a breach of duty? And I say, yes, it does, through negligence. Three, medical transitioning can result in irreversible damage to a child. Students undergoing this process may experience significant harm fulfilling the third step, which is demonstrated incurred loss, injury, or damage. And lastly, fourth step, by instructing in gender ideology and or enabling social transition, schools almost inevitably lead students towards medical transition, a pathway fraught with harm. So that's what we're doing And we've got some exciting news soon, which we can't share, but we will as soon as we've got the okay. Okay, so a case in point, if you think I'm kidding, in Australia, an uh, an insurance company, MDA National, they're worried about it. They're one of the four largest medical insurers. And given a systematic review of evidence that's come out in the last three years in France, UK, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and 18 states in USA, and bodies here in Australia are in the process of researching this carefully. They will not indemnify clinicians, private clinicians, if they gender transition children and youth under 18 years old. They give the permission of that, they won't indemnify it. And we have three gender transitions now suing their doctors in Australia. So we think we've got a pretty strong case to on this approach, okay. In the UK, there's an organisation called the Bad Law Project, and it's headed by a doctor, Anna Lutif. They're doing a class action against the Department for Education in the UK, and this is significant because we follow UK negligence laws, and it's on the basis of negligence laws that they're bringing this case on the path of parents um, against the Department of Education. So around this first project that we're doing, around approach of um, breach of duty of care, we're doing several things. One is that we're collecting evidence to enable a legal action against Department of Education in different states. We're collecting stories, we're collecting story, um, testimonies, okay, and we're watching carefully. In the interim, we've produced alternative educational material for schools because we would rather that this doesn't happen based on evidence-based research and tailored to each specific state. So the book on the right is Sensible Teacher Guidelines on Sex and Gender. Um, We've done so far um, Tasmania and WA, and we've sent them out to all the Tasmania and WA schools. We had about 10% bounce rate, but 95% of the schools that received that, um, those emails clicked on the booklets uh, and, and, of course, opened the email, and that was 95%, which is really, if you're in marketing, that's just obscenely high. Um, and plus, we include a booklet that details per state the social transitioning in schools, the risk and harms. Um, and this has been a collaboration, collaborative work with, my, uh, with lawyers, uh, teachers, uh, policy writer, and myself. And along with that, just recently, we're going to be organising FOIs to all schools in Australia on how many transgender um, students they're processing. Now, the second breach of duty of care that I spoke of, like the Bad Law Project in UK, we've identified um, comprehensive sex education that um, includes hypersexualized content as a form of child abuse and exploitation. If you go and look at the criminal non-contact sexual abuse, what constitutes that? We are seeing those activities in the school. So we've got a lovely group, Courtney's part of that, Jennifer's part of that, Kev's part of that, myself and Tess, um, breaking down the social emotional learning material that different types of it are in the different um, states from Shine or um, 
respect, uh, resilient rights, respectful relationships, that kind of thing, um, that the trans lobby slash gender clinics produce primarily. The universities produce the social emotional learning and the, um, the gender clinics we've noticed are the ones who are mainly pushing the sex, hypersexualized stuff. Note that one of the other key authors of the Safe Schools program, and this is a program, by the way, that was rebranded across all other states except for New South Wales, but close enough, um, they've got something similar. This guy, Gary Dorsett, was one of the authors also, Safe Schools Coalition program uh, that Ross Ward was a key author of, and he pushed that pedophilia should be part of the gay movement and must be legally recognised as a wider sexual liberation. These people are perverts. It's not in my script, but it is. This booklet here, Tess showed me, it's now banned because it's like the pedophile Bible, but this went through all the schools as well. I've put dots in front of the genitalia, but moving on. We already have stories coming out of South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria of children sexually abusing other children. And we're talking children here. We're talking under 12. We're talking about masturbation in the playground because they're taught how to masturbate. So why wouldn't they do it? And using gender neutral toilets to engage in or and or cell sex. We see this behavior as a direct result of the hypersexualization of the curricula. The focus on the sexual impulse being the everything or the end all and be all, and the negligence of schools towards safeguarding, as well as a lack of sense and common decency. There are so many issues on this thing alone that I could spend a couple of hours on what we're seeing and, and how wrong this is, is and the impact on schools, but moving on. So we identified, so there's two revenue streams. The first one you notice is putting kids onto the gender clinics and if they transition, go the transition pathway, they're worth about 115, 220K. Now, a couple of years, a few years, about two or three years back, uh, a drug called PrEP came onto the market for, for all pharmaceutical organizations because it came out of IP. So that means other pharmaceutical organizations could make their own version of PrEP. PrEP is a subscription-based drug. It means that you continually have to take it all the time regularly and it prevents HIV from happening, okay? Now, the lobbies and the third parties, are, we, I notice that the lobbies and the third parties that are promoting sex positivity and pros promiscuity, et cetera, they do, they do this because it's good for business. And we notice that all of them who are doing that education are either are HIV gender clinics or are tied closely to them. In fact, I haven't found one yet that isn't an HIV gender clinic. So, for example, if you go to WA, you, their um, program of LGBTQI um, education is the Inclusive Education WA, and it's just rebranded Safe Schools. If you go to the website and you go to the resource section, let's put it down below a bit, I um, mean, click on that and it will directly take you to sell on how to buy PrEP and PEP. Okay. So I remember when um, we were introducing to Australia and everyone, the whole world, computers and software. And you may not believe it unless you came from that time, but nobody wanted to do that. They watched the movies. Computers were going to bring in robots and they're going to take over the world. Um, it was a really hard sell. And we want to make sure that the, this, the generation, that there were, the new generation would be using computers, either Mac or PC. So... Um, both IBM and Apple really pushed to donate um, their computers into schools in order to make a future um, uh, consumer of ad adult consumers be um, uh, automatic buyers of um, PCs. And that's what they're doing here. They are training kids to go to these clinics to get drugs and they're training for them promiscuity and treating um, promiscuity as STDs as nothing. Um, and there's always there's always a drug for that. Yeah, just uh, keep an eye on, we're, we're way over time, uh, so you might need to sort of get to your final point. Okay, I think we're coming to the close to anyway. Okay, so, our, um, so, so just briefly, remember the Communist Manifesto is about destroying the family unit, 
and all children should be educated by the state and be indoctrinated into correct values. Okay, so one of the things we're doing, we're taking all the information from Project One and putting together a report on controversial issues. We're starting with the Department of Education and we've um, identified where actually states are breaking, Department of Education schools are breaking the law, they're breaking policies because the trans lobbies teach the lawyers that like it, not as it is. And we're putting that formal report on the, um, on the Department of Education's tables. Look, the, the key thing to know is that all this is, is cultural change by stealth. And all this is indoctrination. And it also includes a de-education, de-educating kids on the fundamentals. Their ability to, um, to read, write, do science, history, et cetera, is rapidly decreasing. So lastly, parental training is the last thing that we're doing. It's imperative that parents wake up to what's going on in private state schools. So we've got a program called um, Inoculate Your Child from Wake, Woke. Um, one part is um, a parent dinner hour program on teaching you communication skills to bolster your communication and your ties to family. And the other one, I'll just finish, it's pretty much just finishing up, is you create a circle of trust. You can do this now. S establish with your kids those adults you 100% trust and those you don't. And no school teacher or staff principal should be part of that circle of trust. Establish what content should be for family only to teach and not for school. Rehearse opt-out statements of children to use if, they, um, if they're if they taught something that's evil or whatever. They just say, I'm not, I'm not safe with this. I'm leaving. I'm calling my parents. And then our group is putting to, um, together um, an inoculation program, identifying the, the falsehoods that are taught and teaching the parents how they can rebut it. So I'm going to leave, um, going to introduce Tess um, because she's got she's um, a witness of the worst case scenario when the state comes in and decides that they're going to take away your child and they are going to um, medically and surgically transition them against your will. This was only made public in 2020 um, when a young gay autistic girl was removed from her, uh, for, for amputation of her breast at 15 years old. Um, at 2021, at that time. I think um, Tess noted about 100 families in this uh, similar situation. So I'm going to mute myself and um, over to you, Tess, and I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so we're short on time, so I won't tell you, like, go through my story and stuff. But basically, um, I've been, I've, this has happened to me, to, to my child as well, but I was involved with the court case, which um, Kat showed you the picture about, um, where the state actually came in and because the parents wanted a second opinion, they weren't happy with being told that their depressed child, you know, could be fixed with testosterone and um, breast amputation. They wanted a second opinion and the state came and took the child. And um, unfortunately, the parents have yet, have never seen her since. So um, it hasn't, hasn't happened just once. It ha is happening around Australia. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Wow. All right, we'll try to get one or two questions in. Um, I'm just going to do our uh, one-minute promo, uh, which we always do at this time or earlier. Um, at the end of the meeting, if you are not yet actively supporting AJA, please go to the website um, where you can make sure you've signed up to the email list. I, I want to say a big thank you. Uh, we he held a major fundraiser uh, on Sunday, all those that contributed. We've raised actually $186,000 is the official number. Uh, at the moment, almost 500 donors. We've left the uh, site open. So if you haven't made a contribution, you can go to charity with, a, with the letter D dot com forward slash A-J-A-T. That's A-J-A Sadaka. Um, it is tax deductible. And just finally, next week, we have uh, a, a very special event. Uh, we'll be looking at the so-called uh, settlements. Uh, and former Ambassador Alan Baker, who was one of three people appointed by Bibi Netanyahu to uh, consider the legal status of Jewish communities in Judea Samaria, will be joining us. And we will be having the Australian premier 
of the relevant whose land segment uh, next week. Uh, Courtney, uh, you've got a, just a few minutes to accept one or two questions, I guess, or make any comments you wish. Um, okay. I'll, um, Jeff, go ahead. Jeff has a question. Hi. I I heard Kate mention earlier that uh, legal uh, the the insurance companies covering these these monsters have obviated any payment. And, and I mean, given that there's such huge money involved with Big Farm and all, you would have thought that they would have been uh, careful of their own money because they are so thoroughly exposed to the obscenities of their causes of action that it is impossible for me to get my mind around. How, and not only that, effectively the question also is, why, why aren't there more legal actions to stop this industry in its tracks? So is your question, of why aren't there more insurance um, organisations doing that? Mainly because they didn't know. Most of the stuff was done by stealth. But what I've been doing is the work we've done on the social transitioning risk and harms, I've contacted insurance companies and they're now discussing and looking at it because, so that they can indemnify themselves. Because ages ago when you had those recovered memories, remember that was so popular, when yeah. the insurance companies refused to um, indemnify, that sh shut down immediately. So that's a, a, another approach that we're taking from the research that we're doing. Okay, Anne, you um, want to ask okay. your question? Hi, I'm going to be really quick. Um, so in order to counter the woke uh, critical race theory and the gender ideology indoctrination on these schools, do you think education, such as books from James Lindsay, like uh, Cynical Race Theory and Social Injustice, Race Marxism is a good book to read to counter the woke uh, narrative? And in terms of gender ideology, I think there's a book called uh, The End of uh, Gender. I'll just look at the chat. And um, Why Gender Matters by uh, Dr. Leonard uh, I, I can't That'd remember the exact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm That'd sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm saying, do you think education is a good way to counter the woke indoctrination? That's yeah, just... that, that's why we're doing parental training. Um, I'll also put a list of books together and send it over to David so he can send around the mailing list of um, uh, uh, books that are very good to listen to. Okay. Thank you. Shoshana. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Just have okay. to be very quick. I am. Can we uh, uh, litigate against the teachers who are getting kids to protest the Palestinians? <laughs> I don't know, but I'll ask the question. We're having a meeting with the MP on Friday. I'll ask the question. Alan, you get the last question. Thanks, David. Just quickly on the uh, the school system, I'm just wondering how much autonomy do the individual schools have, or are they more obliged to follow the uh, the Department of Education regulations and instructions? Well, one of the things I've found out, there's a lot of incentives for the schools to do it. One, you've got to understand that there has been so much money indoctrinating people, not just teachers and principals, but everyone, that the right thing to do, the, be the, uh, the best interest of the child is to affirm. And they're not given the end, all the content from um, all the government department. It, it, this is all the way through all government organisations, you know. And then there's been a shutdown on media. And so this has been, this is, and the goal has been through their lawyers, um, Strike Medical's lawyers, is to make sure bring this all by stealth anyway. So that's been the the, the major problem is the lack of, of knowledge um, about what's going on. Um, give me that question again, because my mind just went blank. Your... I, just, I just wanted to ask whether the schools have got autonomy. Can well, they go in a different direction if they want to? If they really want to, but... One, I did a I did an exercise for two months. I called all schools around the different states um, from nine o'clock to one o'clock, Monday to Friday. If you offer them fourteen thousand dollars, which many of them do, uh, for teaching this gender identity ideology or pay um, partly pay for um, resources and things like that, they'll take it. Um, they're also happy to take things like um, um, pay for gender neutral toilets or things like that. There's a lot of incentives. But there is such a strong, you've got to understand that this gender identity ideology has already been in the universities long before it's been in the K1 to K12 course. So you've got activists 
teachers who are strongly pushing this. So they don't have to, and we push it. In fact, we've got three um, principals who are resisting and are offering us their schools on weekends for doing face-to-face training. So there is, there, you can, can do it, but there is, the, uh, in the parental training and, and, some, and we'll run some podcasts on this, and also you'll need to hear Tess, you really need to hear Tess's story. We'll um, talk about um, some of the concerns that the schools have about not being compliant. Uh, Kat, look, thank you so much that I can see there's a lot of interest and some questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, So probably the most important thing uh, in conclusion is uh, if you've got a website or an email where people can uh, contact you, um, those that want to find out more information, uh, get involved. We'll also put it in our newsletter. I can see a few questions. How do we do this? How do we do that? Um, if, if you're happy to provide an email or, or something, um, we will add it to our uh, distribution list. I can see something popping up. Yeah, uh, just go, go to In Defense of Children uh, with English spelling, so C-E, uh, and go to Take Action. And I've got um, some things that you can do. Okay. Um, look, by the way, I will, I'll ask Tess after this if she can come on a Zoom and we'll make it open to everybody. Um, I really feel it. I'm sorry that I took so long because I really feel it's important to hear her story um, because uh, because the state overreach, the state taking children away from parents is very, Outrageous. very real. Yeah, it is. It, it's really real. And you, the, 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 person, the person who knows this inside out is Tess. She's had eight years of this before anyone else knew what was going on and she's been working in this field. So I'm yeah. sorry, Tess, I... I did time this before, but for some reason it extended out. Anyway, so I hope that helps. All right, Courtney, anything you want to say in closing? Um, I just wanted to say um, uh, I I educated myself on this topic a lot, and it gave me courage. And I think for anyone who's a parent or a grandparent, what we have to have right now is courage, and we have to flex that muscle because, um, you know, we adults, we Jews, you know, we stand up to injustices. We fight for ourselves. Children don't have that voice. They rely on us. And I think it's imperative that we, in any small way possible, push back on this. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, Courtney, Kat, Tess, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week when we have Ambassador Alan Baker and Hugh Kitson, uh, and we're looking at the Jewish settlements in Judea, Samaria. Until then, good night all. Good night.